All right. Peter's writing, just to remind you, Peter's writing from Rome in the, in the mid-60s, shortly before his execution, and his main reason for writing is, that, is to combat certain false teachers who are threatening the Christians to whom he's writing. These false teachers were, they were doctrinally and morally corrupt. They denied the, the return of Christ in judgment, and associated with that, they engaged in all manner of sins of the flesh. In chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, Peter emphasizes the importance of their staying on the path that leads to the consummated kingdom, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He emphasizes the importance of their staying on that path by saying, in essence, that the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. Okay, so he's he's talking to me, he says, it's important that you stay on that path because the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. Contrary to what these false teachers were selling, contrary to to what they were pitching, the the idea, the the apostolic preaching and the teaching about about Christ's consummating return, that wasn't based on some cleverly concocted myth. It wasn't based on some clever fairy tale. Not at all. He tells them that, look, he and some others saw in the transfiguration event, they saw one too glorious to leave creation in its current state of corruption. At least that's, that's how I see what he's saying. He's definitely talking about the transfiguration. And they saw there, they saw one who was too majestic and too glorious to leave creation in its current state of corruption. The implication being that he is necessarily going to return in power to consummate the kingdom, to transform reality into a place where there will be no death, mourning, crying, and pain. There will not be what we just heard about. You see, that, that all of this that, that, that goes on now. And so he says, listen, we were eyewitnesses of this one's glory. And so don't be telling me or, or accepting this idea that the notion of Christ's consummating return, that that's somehow a myth or a fairy tale or hogwash, that's not true. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty and of His glory in what we saw in the transfiguration event. Then he says in verses 19 and 21 of chapter 1, he gives them another reason for why the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated and thus why it's important that they stay on that path that leads to the consummated kingdom. He refers them to the absolutely reliable prophetic word, what we, what we know as the Old Testament. The absolutely reliable prophetic word that testifies to the Messiah's coming in judgment and therefore by implication to Christ's return when he comes in judgment, the very thing these people are denying. So he says, listen, this is, the, the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. We saw his glory in the transfiguration, the one who's returning to consummate it, who was so glorious he will not leave creation in its current state of corruption. He's too glorious and majestic for that. And you have the wholly reliable, the completely reliable prophetic word that testifies to his coming through its testimony of the Messiah's coming in judgment. They need to pay attention to that, to heed that word as a light shining in the darkness, that they might be prepared for the Lord's return on the day of judgment. You have to pay attention to what God has revealed. If you ignore that and think you can sort your way through it because you're a genius, and you just ignore that and say, no, I can figure this out, He has revealed it to us. And we have to hang on to that, and He tells them, listen, as as a light shining in the darkness so that you'll be ready for the day of judgment. And the scriptures he mentions, they're absolutely reliable because they are from God. They are not the word of man. They are the reasonings or philosophies of human beings. Humans were involved. They were, the, the scriptures came through their hands, but these people were simply instruments of God's will. They, they wrote what God wanted in, in a complex process. As I mentioned uh, last week, but they, th- this is the Word of God. They wrote through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we have to pay attention to the Word of God. Then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he takes an even, even more direct aim at the false teachers. And we were almost finished looking at this section last week. I'm going to read it. I'll repeat a little bit of what I said, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, as there will also be false teachers among you, 
who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their licentious acts, because of whom the way of truth will be slandered. And in greed they will exploit you with false words, for whom the condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. All right, he says the false teachers, they secretly bring in destructive heresies. They are devious and deadly, which is how heretics and false teachers work. As I've said many times, they don't come in and say, hi, I'm a heretic. They don't do that. They always come in and say, I'm deep. I've seen what others have not seen. These other people are morons. I, on the other hand, am really wise and deep. And so that's how they always present. And so they're devious, but they're also deadly. As Mu says, any who buy into them find themselves on the road to eternal condemnation. He says that many will follow the false teachers by adopting their licentious ways, and the result will be that Christianity will be blasphemed or slandered. It will be discredited. As Christians, if they live in sin and then rationalize that, the world sees that and knows that and says, this is junk. So we talked about that some last week. And then he notes that these false teachers are motivated by greed. They're exploiting the believer's vulnerability by feeding them lies that they are willing, perhaps even eager, to lap up. And they're apparently doing so because they gain something from it. He doesn't specify what they gain, but I can imagine the kinds of things that they do gain. All right, then the the judgment, he says at the last verse here, And in greed they will exploit you, for whom the condemnation from long ago is not idle, And their destruction is not asleep. The judgment planned for these false teachers from long ago is not idle, meaning that it's not suspended. It's not just sitting there. You see, it is still advancing despite their claim that the length of Christ's absence means it won't happen. We'll see that in chapter 3. They say, where is this coming, he promised? All things go on as they always have. Okay, so he's saying it's not just marking time, just sitting here. That judgment is indeed advancing. It is still coming toward them. Okay? It is still coming toward them. His absence doesn't mean it won't happen. And their destruction is not asleep, meaning that, that it thus will not sleep through its hour. Their destruction is not going to oversleep. It's not sleeping as, oh, you know, I'm just here. Destruction is just sitting here. Oh, well, I'll just never come. I'm in slumberland. No, see, it's not going to sleep through its hour, but destruction will come in God's time. You see, so he's telling them, these people are in for it. They are in for it. And it's a very important thing. Now, Moo's comments, Douglas Moo uh, is a commentator, a New Testament scholar. He's written commentaries on a number of books. And uh, this is his commentary on 2 Peter. His, no, his thoughts on the contemporary significance of this text, I thought were worth giving to you at length. I've got three slides of this quote here. He says, the challenge of false teaching is especially great because as Peter reminds us, false teachers are often deceptive, mixing enough truth with their error so that well-meaning but uninformed Christians will be taken in by them. I think at this point of some of the more radical health and wealth gospel advocates on TV and radio... You know what we're talking about there, right? You know, you get into God's business, he gets into yours, and you got this bubble and nothing happens to you, and if you get sick or your child gets cancer, it's because you didn't have enough faith and all this kind of stuff. Okay, he continues, he says, perhaps then the most significant point of application to emerge from this paragraph in our own day is the assumption that Peter makes about the utterly disastrous consequences of false teaching. The specific false teaching Peter is addressing seems to have had its basis in a doctrinal error, the denial of the return of Christ in judgment, and to have led to serious moral failings. See the shameful ways of chapter 2, verse 2, and 2.10 to 22. But application of Peter's warning should not be confined to this one particular heresy. Any denial of clearly revealed biblical truth falls under the strictures that Peter gives here. Thus, as much as we may respect the moral seriousness of Mormons, for instance, their denial of the deity of Christ puts their doctrine into the category that Peter discusses here. Examples can be multiplied endlessly, and false teaching, while taking many similar forms throughout history, is always emerging with new nuances and permutations of errors, 
but it is the broad principle that we must latch hold of here. What we believe matters and matters eternally. You see, it is not simply the idea that we have two or three things to think about and everything else is an open game and it doesn't matter what you believe about those things. So why spend time on that stuff? That's just doctrine. That's just this. You don't want to mess with people. That It's just a source of division and complaints and all that stuff. So let's just talk about one thing. Well, it's just, it's not an option. Theology is not an option. You see, and we all engage in it. He says, what we are advocating is not a heresy hunt. This is important because becoming so ultra-sensitive to every fine nuance of expression that we read people out of the kingdom on the basis of the most subtle theological differences. Yet, as much as we may deplore the way some Christians have been too eager to brand those who disagree with them as heretics, we should at least recognize that they have a sense of the importance of truth. You see? So it's always difficult. One of the most difficult things is to, is to find what are the hills on which one must die. You see, what are the truths that cannot be compromised. And there is no, you know, it's difficult. You see, because if I polled this group, we'd have different ideas on different things, yet we all, we coexist. But there are some things that can't be tolerated. You see? And so it's, where is that? That's hard to know. And some people sit here and say, well, you know, absolutely anything. If you're not right on everything, if you disagree about anything, you're not in fellowship with me, well, then you got a church at one. Right? Because I won't have to probe around long before I'm going to find, well, people understand stuff differently. And we're all on a journey. Okay, but that doesn't mean that truth then doesn't matter. You see, and it takes great wisdom. And by the way, that's one of the great burdens of being an elder. Is trying to wrestle with those kinds of questions and those difficult things. All right, now he says in chapter 2, verses, verses 4 through 10. For if God did not spare angels who sinned, but delivered into chains of gloomy darkness, those being held for judgment, casting them into Tartarus, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but having brought a flood on a world of ungodly people, protected Noah as the eighth, a preacher of righteousness, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction, reducing them to ashes, and making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, who was distressed by the conduct of the lawless in their licentiousness, for while living among them, that righteous man was tormenting his righteous soul day after day and seeing and hearing their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from a trial and how to keep the unrighteous for punishment in the day of judgment, especially those who go after the flesh in the lust of defilement and who despise authority." So here, he, here he, he, he's, he, he, let me get back to the first part of this. The notion that God will allow rebellion and sin to go unpunished, which is apparently what these false teachers are saying. There is no return in judgment. There is no return that is going to finalize history where there's going to be the ultimate squaring up, where all things will be set right. There's not, it's not going to happen. And so it doesn't matter how you live, see? So this notion that he's, God is going to allow rebellion and sin to go unpunished, it's shown to be false by his prior judgments of sin. You see, he says, these guys are going to be condemned. They're toast, he said in the last section. Then he says, for, for if God didn't spare angels, if he brought the flood, if he incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah, why in the world do you think he's not going to judge sin? Why in the world do you think that? He didn't spare these rebellious angels from judgment. He didn't spare the ungodly world of Noah's day from judgment. He didn't spare the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what in the world? Why think these false teachers and their followers are going to be spared from judgment? On the other hand, God did protect Noah, a preacher of righteousness, right? He did protect Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and his family from the flood, and he rescued righteous lot from the incineration of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, he, he's, he's justifying or, or building on what he's just said. He makes his points. You see, he makes his points. He has this extended if-then formula. Okay, this is how he makes his points. He has this extended if-then formula. And according to verse 9, 
You see verse 9, he says, then, according to verse 9, if, if it's true, which it is, okay, if it's true that God cast certain sinful angels into Tartarus to be held for judgment, that God flooded the world of ungodly people but protected Noah, that God incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of what's coming on the ungodly and rescued Lot. If those things are true, which they are, or put it this way, given that those things are true, then at least two things can be concluded. Okay, we can conclude at least two things. God is quite capable of rescuing godly people from a trial of judgment. Right? He rescued Noah. He rescued Lot. Noah, a preacher of righteousness, righteous Lot. He's quite capable of rescuing godly people from a trial of judgment. And he's likewise capable of holding the unrighteous for punishment in the day of judgment. Okay, he says, given that these things are true, we ought to be able to see, he says, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from a trial and how to keep the unrighteousness, unrighteous for punishment in the day of judgment. Those things he cited demonstrate those two points that he draws in verse 9. Now, the fact that he knows how to rescue the godly person from the trial or test of judgment, how to bring the faithful through that sifting event, Right? You look at judgment. Here comes God in this judgment and what's happening? Well, there are people who are taken out. It's a sifting event. Some are taken and condemned and some come through and their faith is shown to be true. So if God, if God knows how to do that, how to bring the righteous through that sifting event of judgment, that's an encouragement to the faithful, right? Here you have false teachers who are telling them, listen, the judgment's not coming. The second coming is not true. There is not going to be a consummating return. Christ isn't returning in judgment. How you live doesn't matter. Well, here he's, he's saying to them, listen, you need to understand that God is perfectly capable of rescuing the righteous and bringing them through the test, the trial of judgment. And so, listen, you have to understand there's every reason for you then to continue to resist the false teacher's encouragement to immoral living. God, the judgment will not be indiscriminate. You don't have to worry that God in the judgment is going to take the righteous and the godly with the wicked. It's not going to be indiscriminate. He is very discriminating. As he was when he brought Noah and his family out. As he was when he rescued righteous Lot. So listen, you don't have to worry about that. His judgment is not going to be indiscriminate. So don't yield to this notion that it doesn't matter how you live that these false teachers are pitching. You hold on to the truth that it does matter how you live. You need to live righteous lives, holy lives that honor God. And then He too will bring you through that sifting event of judgment. You see, and your faith then will shine. Now the flood from which Noah was protected and the incineration of cities from which Lot was rescued, these were acts of divine judgment. And Peter ties the word trial here. I think it's an interesting use of trial. He ties the word trial here to the judgment from which Lot was spared. He does it by repeating the word rescue. You see, he says in verse 7, And if he rescued righteous Lot, meaning from the incineration of the cities that was God's judgment, if he rescued Lot, righteous Lot, and you see in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from a trial. He's talking about, he's, he's referring to the sifting judgment of God as a trial from which God delivers the righteous. So he knows how to do that. God knows how to do that. So he's using trial in that sense there. That they will be, that they will be rescued from this divine act of judgment. And the act of divine judgment he's talking about is the judgment that will punish the false teachers and their followers. It's the judgment that is going to occur when Christ returns. The very th event they are denying. So he says, listen, you need to hold this. You need to be righteous and continue to reject the false teaching. Because God will bring you through the sifting event of that judgment. Okay? Now, you remember in 1 Peter 4.17 where Peter indicates that in the persecution of Christians, that God is beginning his judgment of humanity starting with the church? 
I don't know how many of you are in here for that, but, or if you would remember it, which you probably wouldn't. But that's the, you know, in 1 Peter 4, 17, I think that's what he's talking about there. Whereas the purpose of that judgment in terms of the church that, that has already begun, the purpose of that judgment of humanity that has already begun in the persecution of the church, it was, it was as a trial or it was, a, it was something to test the church, meaning to allow its, the genuineness and purity of its faith to shine through. It wasn't to condemn. It wasn't to judge. But when Christ returns, that phase of the judgment will be to condemn and to punish the unbelievers. Well, now I think he is extending to that phase of the judgment as it relates to the church the notion of a trial. He says this idea as, as the God's judgment against humanity is already manifest, has been shown in the persecution of the church as a test or a trial so that it's the, the a purity of its faith may shine forth. That's for the church the final judgment the coming of christ even that phase will be an opportunity for the genuineness and purity of your faith because as you're sifted out what happens see we come we are are shown we are like the the uh, uh the metal that comes through the fire you see what survives and what comes through so i think he's just applying that same concept now this talk about lot being righteous i don't know if that raises your eyebrows but uh, you wonder about that. Now, Lot certainly was not without fault. You say, well, where, is he, where does this idea of his righteousness come? You see, where, why the, this stress on right, the, the righteousness of Lot? Well, his righteousness, it's implied. You see, in the Genesis account, in, by Abraham's declaration in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, that the Lord doesn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, and then Lot's rescue in Genesis 19. You see, so there's this implication when he says he doesn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, and then who's spared? Lot is spared. So you get this implication, you see, that Lot is somebody who is righteous, and it's also implied by Lot's being the only one in the city who offered hospitality to the visiting angels and his defending them, whatever you think of his offer of his daughters in that regard, but his defending them against this crowd that's gathered around insisting that he bring out these angelic visitors so they can have sex with them. And Lot said, you you can't be doing that. So he was the one who showed hospitality. Okay, he was the one who defended them against that. And you have at least one stream of post-biblical Jewish literature that recognizes this righteousness of Lot. And you also see it in the early church in 1 Clement. So this is what, whatever you think of that, you see it by inspiration from Peter. You see that Lot is somebody who is a a, a righteous person. And I want you to see how Peter emphasizes Lot's distress and his torment over sin. He emphasizes that as a reflection of his righteousness. He says, for while living among them, that righteous man was tormenting his righteous soul day after day and seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. That's an indication of his righteousness. It was killing him being in the the midst of people who were living like that. And Peter, by inspiration, cites that as an indication of a righteous heart and a person who's acting righteously. Now, in America, you think about it. In America, we have no-fault divorce, abortion, homosexual conduct, and sexual immorality of every stripe. Okay, all of which have come to be accepted in the span of four or five decades. You know, I, I, what's the date of that uh, magazine cover you have? Like 1963 or two? Is it Life? Saturday Evening Post, 1961 or 62, John's got the cover of it. That on the cover says abortion, a great social evil. That was 1961. And you see what's happened. Okay, in just the span of four or five decades where we have even Christians becoming insensitive to this and even accepting it as a valid personal choice because we don't want to swim against the tide of a culture and we don't want to be seen as, a, are you a moralist? Are you th- do you think you're holier than thou? You see, that's, that's how you get somebody to shut up. I don't think any of that. I think God has revealed what is true. And I think a society that is that decadent that is engaging in these things and promoting it hand over fist, it's not right. You see, it's not right. 
And so you see here with Lot and how he, how he, how he winds up being given as an example because of that. Now, if we get worked up over it, well, you know, that guy's crazy. You see, that guy, he, he's too, uh, he's taken this too far. This is what Move says about it. He says, this muted reaction to ever more rampant sin is fraught with danger, not only for society, but for the church. As Cardinal Newman, a 19th century Roman Catholic theologian put it, our great security against sin lies in being shocked by it. When we are shocked at something, we avoid it at all costs. But when sin loses its shock value, it can too easily become something we tolerate and then fall prey to ourselves. You see, it's just the, the envelope just gets pushed and pushed and pushed. And I'm telling you, it won't be too long. There already, you see some of this going on, before having sex with children. Uh oh if they consent. We got groups like that. You know, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. This is a group of people, this is what they do. He said, oh, that would never happen, that's stupid. That's where we were 40 years ago. You see, if you don't see this, you see, so what do you do? You say, well, do we say anything? Or do we just get swept up in the tide and not let our voices be heard and say, no, that's wrong. That's sinful. I want somebody to say it's sinful. But you watch, anybody, anybody gets any notoriety, any kind of elevation in the society, they try to shut them up on these issues. Instead of having them be a prophetic voice and say, no, that's wrong. That's sinful. And if anybody says that, they come after, come after them hammer and tong. Now, Mu adds that we don't find more Christians distressed by the sin that rages around us. He says, quote, we, because we do not sufficiently share God's own horror at it. Right? It's like a yawner. So what? You hung up on that stuff. Who cares Who's sleeping with whom or what? What do you care? It's not bothering anybody. Not hurting anybody. Are you trying to impose your morals on me? I'm trying to be a voice for God. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to let His light shine in the darkness. Because a day is coming, and this is not the way to live. All right, he says... The fact God knows how to hold the unrighteous for punishment until his chosen time, until the day. So you have those two things. You see, he knows how to bring the righteous through this sifting event of judgment. So listen, you don't have to worry that it's going to be indiscriminate. So you have every reason not to buy into this push of the false teachers that you join them in immorality. Because the judgment will be very discriminating. And the fact God knows how to hold the unrighteous for punishment until the chosen time, until the day of judgment, means that no ungodly person is going to avoid the judgment, even if they die before Christ's return. They're not going to get out of it. Because these people are saying, hey, it's been decades. Where is this coming? Yeah, you know, people go on, they die. They don't have it. They missed it. They didn't miss anything. <laughs> you see, they didn't miss anything. Nobody's slipping through the judgment net, however long it takes for that day to come. And then he adds that that's especially true of those who indulge the flesh and lust and despise authority. Now, who would that be? That would be the false teachers. It's especially true of them. So you think that they're bopping along, they're telling you that they're going to avoid judgment, that's not going to happen, not going to fall on them, uh, don't worry about it? Uh -uh. God knows how to hold the ungodly for punishment in the judgment. He's holding angels. He's got them locked up, awaiting the day. And you can be sure he knows how to hold people. And so these guys trying to sell this stuff, God knows how to do that. So again, there's every reason for them to continue to resist the false teacher's encouragement to immoral living. That's why he's writing them. He's telling them how you live is important to staying on that path. It's so important I'm going to spend every ounce of energy, even at the point of my death, and to be sure that you hear it after I'm dead. It's so important. So now he's telling them, don't be taken in by these people who tell you that that's not important because Christ isn't returning in judgment. He is returning. Now the examples of God's judgment, let me go back to the first section of this. You thought I was going to skip that, didn't you? All right, 
the examples of God's judgment of the ungodly in the flood and in the incineration of Sodom and Gomorrah, these are well-known uh, Bible occurrences, right? We understand those events very well. But his casting of sinning angels into Tartarus to be held for judgment, that's not described in Scripture. You see, so what is he talking about here? He assumes his audience knows that story and accepts that story, but we're looking and saying, where did they get this from? Where is this story coming from that he can write to them and say, you know that example as well as you know Sodom and Gomorrah and as well as you know the flood. Okay, so the fact he's talking about that, he, it says the story must be a story of some notoriety, right? Because he assumes they know it and it must have some weight because he assumes they accept it. Well, what story is it? All right, now there are a number of people who think, uh, I would say a very small minority today, who believe that Peter's referring to the initial fall of Satan and angels who chose to rebel against God. Now there certainly was a fall. I don't know that, in fact, I don't think that you can, you can infer Satan's fall as many people try to do from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. But I think one can infer a fall of, that, that there's some kind of angelic fall. You can infer that from the existence of demons in what was originally a very good creation. So initially they're very good, now we have this, so somewhere something has happened. Okay, and there are people who think, well, that's what, that's what he's referring to. But I think it's much more likely in the context of first century Judaism that Peter is referring to a, here to a subset of fallen angels, to a subset of demons, those who were confined to Tartarus in distinction from those who were not. Okay, well, then what is it? What's he talking about? Here's my idea, what I think. First, let me say something about Tartarus. That may strike you as, why does he say Tartarus? Many translations say hell. Okay, the verb is Tartarao, and it means to throw into Tartarus. <laughs> well, we don't know what Tartarus is, so we switch it for hell, which I think confuses people, because hell is the final place, whereas Tartarus is this holding pen. Here's what Michael Green says about Tartarus. Tartarus in Greek mythology, well-known word, in Greek mythology was the place of punishment for the departed spirits of the very wicked, particularly rebellious gods like Tantalus. Just as Paul could quote an apt verse of the pagan poet Aratus, Acts 17.28, so could Peter make use of this Homeric imagery. So there was this concept, you see, of this holding pen, this dreadful place. And he, Peter, he takes that concept and applies it to what God has done to these sinning angels. He's thrown them in that place. In fact, you see the noun Tartarus in the Septuagint of, in Job 40.20 and Proverbs 30.16, apparently referring to some kind of netherworld or realm of spirits. So he takes this and adapts it for the holding place for this story about angels with which they're familiar. Now what still, what's he talking about? Get back to that. Now, as the vast majority of commentators conclude, I think Peter's probably alluding to a traditional Jewish understanding and elaboration on Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Okay, according to that understanding, the sons of God, you know the, the text in Genesis 6, the sons of God, that refers to certain angels who married and procreated with human women who consequently were confined to a dreadful spiritual realm awaiting final judgment. Now just hang on. You see, I think that's what he's referring to. And so do, you know, the vast majority of commentators think he's referring to that. You say, well, why do they think that? Well, in the first place, this was a very widespread understanding of Genesis 6, 1 to 4 in first century Judaism. It's everywhere. It's in all kinds of, of intertestamental literature. And literature of the first time, it's frequently reflected in that literature. And most extensively, it's reflected in what's called the Book of First Enoch. Okay, First Enoch is, has the most elaborate description of this whole thing. It's in First Enoch. And who, in that book, First Enoch is, excited, is cited expressly by Jude in verses 14 and 15. He's aware of the Book of Enoch. 
Okay, and you remember the, the connection between 2 Peter and Jude. There is some kind of literary connection, most likely, whether Peter borrowed from Jude, Jude borrowed from Peter, or both of them went from another common source. Okay, so that's a significant thing, is that you see Enoch very familiar with this, I mean, the, the greatest statement of this idea, and Jude is familiar with Enoch. Okay, and then secondly, Jude, without question, knew Enoch, and he speaks in verse 6 of angelic judgment that is consistent with 1st Enoch. And so he, Jude very likely shared 1st Enoch's understanding of Genesis 6 that it involved angels who sinned. That's how, they, that's how Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4 was understood. Schreiner says in his commentary, it's quite unlikely that Peter veered off in another direction from Jude, for regardless of the questions of literary dependence, Peter from Jude, Jude from Peter, or both of them from somewhere else, regardless of those questions, it's obvious that Jude and Second Peter both drew from common tradition in some form. So if we have Jude over here where it looks, he clearly is familiar with the book of Enoch. You have this widespread understanding of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Enoch is the most elaborate description of that idea. Jude knows Enoch, and Jude speaks of this in terms consistent with Enoch, and Peter and Jude are connected. So it seems like a, a, that would make sense. Now, if the angelic sin to which Peter refers, if it is indeed based on that popular Jewish understanding of Genesis chapter 6, well, then his examples are in order in Genesis. You get Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, the angels. You get the flood, 6, 5 to 8, 22, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. So he would then be going in order along in the book of Genesis. Now, Peter's wording, it echoes the language of the popular Jewish understanding. You see here when he says he didn't spare angels, but he delivered them into chains of gloomy darkness. Okay, well, then, for instance, in 1 Enoch chapter 10, verse 4, it speaks of binding the disobedient angel hand and foot and throwing him into the darkness. And then finally, you have that this, this was the dominant view of the early church of Genesis chapter 6. I know you haven't heard it, maybe. But this was the dominant view of the early church of Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, that it referred to angels who had sinned. A fellow named Sidney Page in his book, The Powers of Evil, a biblical study of Satan and demons, he says that this was the view of Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Lactanius, Ambrose. So this was a very well understood view, not only in intertestamental literature of the Jews, but it was the dominant view in the early church. So then you think that Peter is over here saying something different, and yet this is how the early church, they held this view of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. In fact, uh, uh, Page says, this view held the field in the east until the early, early in the third century, and in the west until much later. Okay, so not, I know it may be unusual to us, but it, it, it was a, a very common view. So I think he's probably referring to that. Now, if, if that's right, if he is indeed referring to that popular understanding of Genesis chapter 6 in first century Judaism, that doesn't mean that Peter or Jude endorses all of that understanding. You see, the, the, the imprimatur the Holy Spirit puts on aspects of that extra-biblical tradition doesn't mean that the other parts of it are true. You see, he's simply saying that, listen... Here, there is some aspects of this extra-biblical tradition, this elaboration, this understanding of Genesis that was, in fact, correct. That they did, in fact, understand that correctly. He speaks only of the angel's sin and, the, and, and their punishment, and thus he may be only endorsing that the angels married and procreated with human women and are held in this dreadful, unpleasant place awaiting condemnation as a consequence of their doing so. Those are the only things that he says. Okay, so there's no reason to think that he's, he is then endorsing this idea. He doesn't say anything. Well, how did they do that? How did the angels execute that sin of marrying human women and procreating with them? How did they, how did they pull that off? He doesn't say anything about that. Okay, he doesn't talk about that. How about their offspring? Are they giants? He doesn't say anything about that. How about, the, are they responsible for the bringing of the flood? He doesn't say anything about that. He simply is citing, I believe, certain aspects of that and saying these things were true in that extra-biblical tradition. That interpretation, that understanding was correct. That in fact, now that, you know, sometimes people say, well, you can read Genesis 6 a different way. I understand that. 
that there are different ways to skin the Genesis 6 cat. What I'm saying to you is it looks to me that Peter accepted the interpretation of Genesis 6 that was prevalent in, in Judaism of the first century. So that says to me that the Holy Spirit is saying that is the correct interpretation, that sons of men there refers to angels. Okay? Now, let me say a little bit more before you pull your hair out. All right. Now, angels procreating with human women, that, that definitely strikes us as bizarre, right? God, sometimes he dispatches faithful angels in human form. We, we know that. But unless Genesis chapter 6 is an exception, demons or fallen angels, they never in Scripture become or appear to become physical so as to be visible to all people. At least no example I'm aware of. We wind up seeing that, you know, that they become physical or appear to become physical so they can be seen by everybody. The serpent, you say, in the garden, well, he's clearly one of the animals. He says that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. He's being animated by Satan, but he's not Satan incarnate. The only other time Satan or demons are seen, they're in visions. See, not, not being manifested physically so that they can be seen by everybody. But the only other time you have them is in visions in Zechariah, Matthew, Matthew 4, 9, and 10, Revelation, several places. And the only time we're told anything about their appearance, it's in Revelation 9 where they're described as nightmarish locusts and fiendish cavalry. Revelation 12 where Satan is portrayed as the great red dragon and 16, 12 to 16 where they're seen as frogs. Okay, so what's up here? Now, in the popular Jewish understanding... These fallen angels, they took human form. But he doesn't say anything about how they executed this sin. He doesn't, he doesn't put the Holy Spirit's seal on that. He doesn't say anything about how they did it. It's possible that they, these fallen angels married human women and procreated with them by possessing human males. Rather than through materialization. Okay, that's what makes sense to me. That may not satisfy you. This whole thing may not satisfy you. You may think that it's better to think of them as, as the initial fall of angels. Okay? But this idea, you see, well, well, we know that demons do possess people, or did. I think they still do if under different uh, circumstances. That's another subject. But we know they certainly, that, that they did. But here, see, it, it would be sufficient, perhaps, see, that they would, for, for them to possess somebody would be sufficient to satisfy their lust for the women. In other words, what they gained through that experience as possessing somebody was sufficient to satisfy their lust for the women, which lust, you see, it's, it's indicated in Genesis 6 too. It says, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive. You see, so this is the idea. You have this thing. I know the bell rang. Let me say one other thing, otherwise you'll be gone. This guy didn't know about this. I know that Matthew 22, verse 30 you know the text where it says angels neither marry nor are given in marriage? That doesn't rule out the possibility of demons marrying human women, possessing them, marrying them, because it's quite possible that he's referring to only to faithful angels rather than fallen ones or only to what happens in heaven rather than on earth. Okay, so I don't think you can say that that eliminates that. Certainly the, you know, you, you, the early church didn't see it that way. You see, so I think this is what he's talking about, this widespread idea where you had these, these angels who, who committed this sin, and it was known far and wide, then what happened? God took them, and he imprisoned them until the judgment. Okay, the other, other idea is you say, well, they're the, it's the initial fall, then you have none of these details at all about him holding them in prison. Whereas in the other case, you do. All right, I have more to say about that, but I heard that bell. Thanks for hanging on.